Spike, over so many years, so many films um, that really touch and reach you. I, how do you do it? How do you just keep going? Well, I've been blessed be able to do what I love. Not many people have that blessing. A lot of people go to their grave, haven't worked at a job they hate all their life. Mm. So that timing, talent, hard work, support, those are winning ingredients. When I look back uh, over the life story and your history, I'm reminded that perhaps your parents also did things that they love. Um, mm -hmm. Your father was a jazz musician. Still is. Still is. Yes. Your mother... She was a teacher. ...was a teacher. She taught black literature. There was a vocation there. Wow. Do you think they gave that to you? Oh, yes. Uh, not just me, my siblings too. And they all work, still work, you know, with me. Uh, uh, right now, we just finished the second season. She's going to have it where my sister, Joie, plays Nola's mother. And she also wrote an episode. Or my brother, Sankey, wrote an episode. They did that the same. They did the same thing for episode one. So season one, season one. And we just grew up in a very artistic household where the arts was encouraged. Not for, not that it could be a career, but just, you know, my my parents really want to have a, you know, they know the arts. And then if we want to pursue that, fine, but we, we would, you know, no way was pushed in any direction. And you credit your mother with introducing you to the film. She would take you to the movies. Yeah, my mother would take me to movies. My father hated movies. <laughs> but he loved sports. So my love of sports came from my father. And... Uh, I was talking to Martin Scorsese the other day because he he just he loved he called me tell me he loved the Black Klansman and every time I speak to him I remind him every time I speak to Martin I remind him you know what my mother took me to see Mean Streets when I was a little kid <laughs> he's like why did she do that <laughs> but uh, that's uh my mother was a cinephile how old were you when she was taking you to see Mean Streets and films like that I think sophomore year in high school yeah yeah, yeah. And, uh, but even when my mother was taking the movies, I still at that point had not decide I want to be a filmmaker. I just, you know, I just love, I was my mother's date. She loved films, so, you know, she would, she didn't want to go alone. So I'm, I'm the eldest, so I would go. So you're a teenager, you're being exposed to sides of America, sides of imagination that otherwise you might not have had access to. You were in Brooklyn at this point, right? I mean, there's a, there's a bunch of movie theaters in, in New York City, so yeah. anybody might go to movies. So you have access to go to movie theaters. Yeah, but I'm, I suppose I'm, I'm thinking we back. We use the word access. I'm though. thinking back to the New York that, um, that I would visit sometimes to see family uh, back in the 80s for me. Um, and the neighborhoods I was going to, it, it's not always the case that you even had the money to 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 to, to get to the cinema. No, no. black folks going to movies. Okay, they had money for movies. Come on, Shaft. <laughs> How you think? Who you think was going to those black ex exploitation films? The one white folks. Yeah, black people. Black people. We we always got money to go to movies. Yeah, I mean that's. Yeah, I wonder if it, maybe it was the immigrant experience. Because West so, Indians so, went to movies too. <laughs> <laughs> they were busy one. cleaning and, and, and washing. My brother, and doing my jobs brother, and, believe yeah. me, believe me. Your people that came from the islands, Jamaica, Trinidad, that were all over wherever, <laughs> they went to the movies in New York City. They had money. They went to Apollo. You had one of them actually in the film Black Klansman, Harry Belafonte. Yes. Who was originally from Jamaica, who did a Giant. wonderful, wonderful performance yes. at the end. Yes. Un sort of unexpected. Well, you jump, in, you jump ahead, though. Yeah, I am. I am. I am. But, I, you know, we all love Harry. Okay, so let's... Freedom Fighter. And is that why you cast him? Well, Mr. Belafonte, Mr. B, as everybody calls him, we've had a running joke for many years. Every time you see me, we say, can Ozzy Davis just sit on one film so I can get in? <laughs> So uh, it just happened with timing that this was the first time we worked together. 
Amazing. You were lucky enough to go to Morehouse. Was that a family tradition? You were going back to Atlanta? Well, I was born in Atlanta, and my grandmother lived in Atlanta. So that era, if you were black and you lived in Detroit, Boston, Philly, D.C., New York, and you had grandparents down south, your parents packed your bags and <laughs> shipped your ass down south <laughs> so you get a break. Yeah. So our summers, me and my siblings and I, we split our summers between Snow, Snow Hill, Alabama, which is my father's mother, and Atlanta, Georgia, which is my mother's parents. So we spent the summer between those two places. My father went to Morehouse, where when he was a freshman, Dr. Martin Luther King was a senior. And Martin Luther King the third in our classmates, mm. class 79. And my grandfather went to Morehouse. And my grandmother went to Spelman. And my mother went to Spelman. So these are historic black schools in Atlanta, Georgia, they cross street across the street from each other. For a British audience where there are no colleges of that kind, what kind of education was that? Uh, presumably a seminal age you, you were... It's a fine, uh, a, a very a great education. I mean, the reason why black schools were formed because we couldn't get into white schools. The reason why a lot of black business were formed because we couldn't go downtown and shop mm -hmm. places. So segregation really built, you know, black foundations. It's not just Morehouse. You got Morehouse, Howard, Spelman, Howard, Hampton... Tuskegee, you know, it's a tradition of uh, black schools. And what I found is that it wasn't just your classmates, your professors, your teachers were black, and they really, really, really mm -hmm. pushed you. Whereas if you went to big white college or university, you know, you just look like you're just there because if they don't have you, they're not going to get the money from the government, that type of thing. You've talked, certainly in the past, about not being a straight-A student. Right. Um, I think there's a particular um, professor, it may be later when you go to NYU film school, that that you that taps... You, that was at Morehouse. Uh, a film teacher, his name is Dr. Herb Eichel, Professor Herb Eichelberg, he's still teaching there. So Morehouse didn't have a film major, so I took... My major was across the street at Clark College, was mass communications, which was TV, radio, film, and journalism. So that was my major, and that's where, you know, that's where it started, really, my junior year. And you knew at that point that film was what was going to... Well, I didn't know at that point, but I knew that I had to take a major because I exhausted all my electives <laughs> my freshman and sophomore year. Right. <laughs> so I took uh, I thought it would be interesting you know I wasn't going to med school I wasn't going to, <laughs> I wasn't going to, going, to, going to law school and and I wasn't you know I didn't want any you know nine to five job and you were clear about that you weren't going to do nine to five. Oh, I wasn't doing that no way and your first breakout film the first film I did was called The Answer NYU Graduate Film School is a three-year program. The first film I did was the answer was the plot is a young African-American writer-director is hired by a big Hollywood studio to do a remake of Birth of a Nation. That's right. That's my first year. But the question was my breakout film, and that was Joe's Best Side Barbershop, I see. which is my thesis film, which won the Student Academy Award. And thought that because I had because I had the student Academy Award that students would call me, my phone would be ringing off the hook. <laughs> and it didn't ring. <laughs> it rang from the phone company, <laughs> paid the motherfucking paid the bill. bill. <laughs> <laughs> and Con Edison <laughs> paid, paid, paid a, a little electricity <laughs> and, and Brooklyn Gas paid the gas. So struggle. It was it was good though. I struggled and uh, so I Got the money together the summer 1985 to do 
She's going to have it. We shot it in 12 days, two six-day weeks, July 1st to July 14th, 1985. Budget was, total budget was $175,000. We submitted to a, a San Francisco festival, got in, submitted to Cannes, won the pre de Janice, and then the Island Pictures picked it up. So I finished 82, and she's having to come out to 86. So, it's a, so you know, this is a few years. Yeah, three, four year gap. And that's why I tell my students in NYU, when I'm a tenured professor to graduate film school, there, there's no such thing as overnight success. Mm. And how do they, what do you say to them in terms of getting through the hard times? Well, I found, I always try to tell my students that there's no one way to do anything. And what ha- works for me might not happen, might not, might not work for you. And when when people tell me, you know, when the students ask me or journalists like yourself, you know, what gets you through the hard times, I would say because you do because you've had a calling. Like this is what you want to do, this is what you feel you put here on earth to do. And it's been my experience. The people who have that call are the ones that, that get over those hurdles. And the people aren't able to leap those hurdles like Edwin Moses, another Warhouse man, <laughs> they stumble yeah. because they're doing it for some other reason, fame, yeah. money, yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. So she's got to have it. Then you've got, in that period at least, um, that spoke to me, because I'm thinking of the films that I saw, um, Jungle Fever, Do the Right Thing. After, she'd have it with school days. School days! After school days, oh. Do the Right Thing. The Mo Better Blues, Jungle Fever, Malcolm X, Crooklyn. You are seen as a filmmaker who can flip between being independent and Hollywood. Would that be fair? Or yes, have, yes. Have one Jordan, <laughs> <laughs> one Jordan sneakers in the independent world, and the other <laughs> Jordan is in uh, the studio system. And equal- they have no problems going back and forth. You know, you got to get your films made and get it done wherever you get it done. Uh, and presumably sometimes you are making films that are other people's films. You've been asked, you've been requested. I mean, obviously the film speaks to you. Uh, and Storytelling. I mean, there have yeah. been stuff where I had not originated the, yeah. the project. Late example is Black Klansman. The last time I spoke to you or interviewed you... Um, it was maybe a year into the presidency of Barack Obama. And I remember you said to me at the time that you were not keen, cool, at all sure about this kind of post-racial America. How? And I didn't believe. The minute I heard that term, I said, this is some bullshit. <laughs> and history has proven me correct. Because you look at what we been dealing with the last 18 months in the White House. Agent Orange. Got that got that moniker from uh, Buster Rhymes. He, he came with that. When you look back on Obama's period, um, how do you feel about it? In retrospect, I think that we were... In such a euphoric, euphoric state for eight years, two terms, and we forgot about you can only run for two terms and weren't really prepared for uh, the onslaught that would come from the Republicans for that election at the heat. But there was quite a lot of resistance while he was in office. Uh, oh, yeah, the but they couldn't do nothing about it. So they had to wait till he was out. And they were more prepared. I think they were more prepared to work harder than the Democrats. And your your take on life today, it seems to me that many of the life films... Where? In America. In America. Yeah. It feels to me like many of the films that you've made in the past um, resonate today, uh, are powerful today. Mm-hmm. When I think of the Black Lives Matter campaign, when I think of the 
persistent rhetoric around um, race and privilege and white supremacy so much that you have contributed. I would have used the word rhetoric, though. <laughs> Reality. Yeah, I've, I've had the crystal ball a couple of films. Where we were talking, I mean, go back, do the right thing. I wrote that script in 88. I'm talking about gentrification in 88. Yeah. I'm talking about global warming in 88. <laughs> you know, so it was very frightening to me to see the, the murder of Eric Gardner by the NYPD strangled to death yeah. in Staten Island. I mean, it looked like the same that happened to Ray Raheem. In fact, so much that I called my longtime editor, Barry Brown, who edited Do the Right Thing, where we intercut the footage between the movie strangulation of Ray Raheem with the real life strangulation of Eric Gardner. Where's the hope? Are we going backwards? We're going backwards, but uh, we got to keep fighting. That's never stopped. The struggle is never going to end. So got to keep, keep, keep in there. And the contribution of the arts to that struggle, more important than ever. Yes, but I've always felt that the best music movies have always come at a time when, you know, when they're... <laughs> yeah, strife. Yeah. When, when, when it's just going crazy and artists have to... Uh, whether it be a song, a novel, a play, a movie, artists hold up the mirror and like to what's going on and say, WTF, civil rights, the great songs, the Curtis Mayfield were a winner, uh, the, the protest songs of Vietnam. So stuff that comes out of, you know, black struggle. All that stuff, you know, artists, great artists have uh, contributed to it. And we lost one yesterday, Read the Franklin. Oh, yeah. Big blow. Yeah. Huge. Um, huge. I remember her at the inauguration. It was... You were there? Yeah. It was incredible. That It was so cold that day. It was so <laughs> cold. <laughs> I, I, and then you had to walk. You had to walk right up the oh. mall. It oh. was cold. Uh, for, there were lots. Of, what I remember is lots of African American women wearing furs, uh, furs yeah. <laughs> hats, gloves, uh, layers, and I remember when Aretha came on. It was like she'd walked out the crowd because she was like the many African American who could have been my mother. <laughs> and then she opened up, and there's a line in that piece: "Let freedom." ring or let freedom reign mm -hmm. and just tears came rolling down the eyes the queen of soul you know she sang the end credit songs Aretha sang the end credit song for Malcolm X the classic Donna Hathaway song Someday We'll All Be Free mm. she sang that Someday ladies and gentlemen looking at my clock <laughs> 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 Not while we're alive, but... It, okay. oh, when is this day coming? <laughs> when is this day coming? Uh, uh, another artist that you um, have responded to, liked, think his music is in the Black Klansman, is Prince. Yes. Uh, who we also lost uh, a short while ago. Right. Uh, a wonderful, eclectic artist. Mm -hmm. uh, how did you get this piece... Uh, a, Formerly unpublished piece, I think, that, that, that is the soundtrack runs across the film. The end credits. Yeah. Oh, you're right. The end credits. Uh, Troy Carr is a very good friend of mine. He's an advisor to the Prince Estate. And I knew I needed a very, I needed a, a great song, a spiritual song that they would somewhat, I hate this word, heal, but. I think we need, I thought we need, I knew we needed it at the end of this film, mm. which is follows uh, the code of mm. Charlottesville. And Troy flew to New York, I showed him the film, he was knocked out. He said, no, I have the song. And uh, one of the, one of the first jobs the state, that the state had to do was to, to, to to uh, they had to archive all his music in Paisley Park. 
I mean, the man was in the studio every day. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> it was like a catalog that went on forever. And yeah. out of 10,000 cassettes, this one cassette turned up from 1983 where it's just him on piano and singing. And on this cassette, we found, uh, Troy found the song, The Negro Spiritual, Mary Don't You Weep. Mm. And he played it for me. And right there, I knew Prince wanted me to have this. <laughs> Wonderful. My, my brother, there's Wonderful. no way in the, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm having that. Yeah. There's no way in the world, world. <laughs> out of 10,000 cassettes, all of a sudden this song pops up. Yeah, yeah. No one's ever heard it before. Yeah, yeah. I said, my brother Prince wanted the world to have this in this in this film for the end credits. And it's amazing. Uh, it was wonderful. And it was one of those films which I watched, you know, you're there at the beginning and you're the last one out of the, the theatre. It, it, it was so moving. Tell me how this film came about. Jordan Peele called me out of the blue. He said, you know, he said, I got some. How you doing? You no, know, did the whole, what up, what up, what up? <laughs> got that out of the way. I thought that's something uh, he might want to be interested in. So he pitched it to me. Six words. Black man infiltrates KKK. Which is like the best bitch. I mean, that, that is high concept. Yeah. <laughs> high concept. Can't get higher than yeah. that. And uh, my first reaction was, is this true? He said, yes. And I also, the same time, I thought about the, the very funny, famous skit, you know, Dave Chappelle. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> and uh, he said, no, it's, it's true. Told me about Ron Stallworth. Yeah. Sent me the book. And uh, that was it. And the story is basically Ron Stallworth's... Um, Stallworth. Stallworth. His um, infiltration into right. the Ku Klux Klan once he joined... In Colorado the, Springs. The Colorado Springs. He was also police the first department. black police officer in Colorado Springs, too. He's still with us? Yeah, he's still with us. He's alive. He's been doing interviews. And was he on set at all? He didn't come to set. He just he was just there for the read through. Right. And and pre production where he spent a lot of time with John David Washington. And John David Washington, who I had never seen before, but is Denzel's son, who was incredible in this yes. film. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that casting. I knew he could do and it. He had an amazing afro. I mean, the most amazing afro and afro. I now want an afro. <laughs> He, uh, he didn't have to audition, he didn't have to read for it, put himself on tape. I just said, I offered him the part. There's no doubt about it. The film clearly is not just any old film. It's a film at this time. Um, it's timing. Um, it's very apropos now, right? And there's an urgency because of that. And you were aware of that while you were filming it? I mean, like, sometimes oh, I was projects aware. can I was start aware. a year in advance. I was aware of that because this guy had been in the White House already and I saw what the destruction he was doing so Kevin Wilmot and I co-writer we wanted this film to even though it's a period piece to comment on the contemporary world we live in today the make America great again yeah but all those statements are old America first was a slogan that the the Klan had in the 1920s you know against immigrants so all this stuff, all this hate's been recycled and repackaged. And there was a sensibility to this film, um, uh, a take on history, obviously references to... Uh, Cinematic black, history. Yeah, cin black with, with the, films. With the Gown with the Wind and uh, Birds of a Nation. Birds of a Nation. Mm -hmm. Are you... Um, when you make a film like this, do you have a sense that this we're, we're working with something great, this is going to be, I mean, you know, or do you just... You know? No, I mean, I can only talk for myself. You you hope that the film's going to turn out well. You do you do your best you can, and that's all you can do. You know, I never went into any film, you know, like, oh, anything, no preconceptions. Let's all work hard, do the best we can do, and make the best film possible in front of behind the camera. The film ends 
with referencing to Charlotte's film. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think for a British audience brings back in very real time um, the loss of life, uh, the consequence of far-right rhetoric. That can get lost because we're living in a period of daily tweets and daily news and salaciousness. The very, very seriousness of lives lost Mm -hmm. um, and where that KKK agenda ends can get lost. Can you just say something about that? Uh, I was in Marlins Vineyard. It was an island off the coast of Massachusetts. We have a summer home. It was August 12th. A year and five days ago. Yeah. I was in Marlins Vineyard. Watched CNN. And I saw this despicable homemade apple pie act of American terrorism with the murder of Heather Hale. And I knew how to end it. That was not the scripted ending. So we didn't start shooting until September. So we had to end it. But it wasn't a lock because I still thought I needed to get the blessing from Susan Bro, who was a mother of Heather, who lost her daughter, and uh, mm. got Mrs. Bro's number, and as best as I could, try to give my condolences. I yeah. mean, what 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 can anyone say to any mother yeah. who loses their daughter? But but like that. Mm. Did the best I could and explain her why I, why I called her and uh, she's you know we talked and said she's been a fan of my work and so she uh, you know gave me the blessing to use that shot of the car that uh, murder weapon that car speeding down a crowded street yeah it ends up being a film of a lot of light and shade. It is an entertaining film, Mm. um, despite the huge emotional punch at the end. Um, Can I just say- Dakota. I think it's an amazing achievement. I really, really- Thank you, I appreciate that. Like, enjoyed. Now we go way back, man. (laughs) (laughs) I know, but I mean, I wanted to say that. No, no, I appreciate it. You know, here's the thing though, is I, you know, I alluded to it earlier, but as a filmmaker, I, I try to tell my students, this shit is not easy. It's hard to make a hard, it's hard work to do a horrible film. <laughs> it is hard work to do a horrible film, let alone a good film. So, every film, I know I might be repeat myself, do the best you can. Roll the dice, blow on them, and just hope it doesn't come out snake guys. <laughs> now, now That's me, all you can do. Yeah, I I can't because I, there's so many. No, let me just. There's so many things factor in that you have no control. Your marketing is it going to be? Is there a, a huge snowstorm when your film opens? I mean, it goes. There's just so many intangibles. The right time. I mean, one of the. I'll tell you this, one of the best things about Black Klansmen, a lot of people, because of this film, they've gone back to films, or they've gone back to my body work to see films they hadn't seen. 20th Hour, Bamboozled, Summer Sam, Amir, and they're like, yeah. they're writing about these films yeah, yeah. like they're seeing for the first time. Yeah. So those films, just like 20th Hour, it came and went. That's considered the best film about 9-11 ever, you know. But it wasn't like that when the shit came out, though. Yeah. So that's been very good. There's people have been have gone back and reinduced. Maybe never saw, maybe only saw it one time and just like shrugged it off. But the, the film, the film's getting recognition that they didn't get on the release. 
and a new generation of people are coming to True. your work, um, yeah. which is hugely important. And mm -hmm. look, True. I, I remember when you received um, the Oscar for your honorary work, honorary, yeah, lifetime of achievement. Um, and much more to come, much more to come. But I think it was Denzel Washington, or it may have been Samuel L. Jackson, talked also it was Denzel. about the amount of people. In front and behind the camera. In front and, and behind and the camera. You know he said, and, he, and you know what he said? He said, don't get mad, Tyler Perry. <laughs> <laughs> My brother, Tyler Perry. But that yeah. was obviously hugely important to you. What's that? To bring people on and bring no, that was that was a, that was from the get go. Because the thing was is that the unions weren't letting in black people, and so I had to fight with the unions, with the teamsters, to get people in. The biggest fight I had was with the teamsters, because I I I told them, look, we got some black people driving these trucks at Malcolm X. And they said, we don't have no teamsters, black teamsters. I said, yes, then you know what then? Well, then the fruit of Islam will be driving the trucks. <laughs> I told them that. This is interesting. And then the is... next day, they, they hocus pocus miraculously found some black teamsters. This is interesting. But I had to do that. This is like a, this is a, if you like a, a deal that's sewn up from the left because this is the unions saying these are our people, those aren't our people. I know, I, I mean, yeah. it's ironic because uh, the unions for being the people, but in the film industry, they, they really, I mean, the Teamsters, uh, the local unions with the, I mean, other unions, the, the yeah. wardrobe, hair, makeup, camera, they weren't, back in the day, they weren't too inviting to people of color. I mean, you go on, I mean, it's, you go on sets, there'd be no black people there. Maybe I wanted to have some black PAs when they're shooting Harlem or the Bronx. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, that was Lily White. And they're okay with it. Spike, there's one other relationship in this film that really spoke to me and I think might resonate with a British audience. And that is the relationship that has long existed in the United States um, between African-Americans and the Jewish community, mm -hmm. which is a subtext in this film. Um, mm -hmm. It is, uh, you know, the Jewish community and African-Americans work closely together on civil rights and fighting for civil rights. Right. It's a story in South, America, in South Africa mm -hmm. uh, um, with the ANC. Um, and I'm afraid anti-Semitism is a big discussion point in our own country. As a New Yorker who's very aware of that symbiotic relationship um, that comes up in this film, can you just say something about how important that was? Kevin Wilmer and I, uh, we just knew that there was, we could mine a lot of stuff out of making the, uh, his partner, uh, Ron Storr's partner, Jewish. So he's he's faking to be a clan sympathizer, and he's faking that he's not Jewish. So he was code switching twice. <laughs> <laughs> so, but there's a lot of code switching because uh, Ron Stallworth is trying not to let he's he's faking the clan who's on the phone with. <laughs> <laughs> and then this lady who he's trying to talk to. That's right. Who's calls cops pigs. That ain't gonna work for her either. <laughs> so that's interesting thing that, that that attracted me is that you have these people who are they're code switching. You know, there's something and then there's something they're else. not and there's someone else. So it's kind of playful, you know. But it's real that. life, I guess. I mean, we, we, oh, yeah, we all I mean, do that. I mean, it's, you know. it's, I mean, one of the Nick the Terrorist characters says uh, Jews change all, he says uh, Jews change names all the time. They kill Christ. I mean, that, <laughs> that was. <laughs> I've seen, yeah. You know, people do that. 
I thought, it, I mean, it was wonderful because they end up in a, uh, in, in quite an important relationship and it just occurred to yeah, me. Yeah, but another thing though, we didn't want this to be a typical buddy cop film no, too. So that's, so that's yeah. something we had to really be on the look, up, look out for. Because I know that even the first time, there was the, they, every year they had this thing, I forgot what they call it, it's, it's having Las Vegas conventions for, a convention for the theater owners. And there was a short, short clip was shown. It wasn't even a trailer. And the next day, Holler Reporter or Deadline, one of those industry mags said, Spike Lee's new buddy cop film. And I, I, I got, I got an Instagram. It so wasn't that. I got an Instagram right away and tried to <laughs> dead that narrative. It was not that. I don't know how he got to that, but that was not the film I saw. Mm-hmm. Um, you've been in this country many, many times. Oh, London. Yeah. I mean, England. Yeah, yeah. I've been coming here since '84. I was coming here when Brixton was black. <laughs> <laughs> you need to come down to Tottenham. <laughs> well, 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 look, here's the thing, though. Gentrification is worldwide. Yeah, yeah. Not just in Brooklyn. Yeah, yeah. Not just in the People's Republic of Brooklyn. Uh, worldwide. Uh, and Brixton, I used to have fun in Brixton. Poorer people get pushed out. out, out That's further, global. Further out. But global. What, but, Spike, you have got one considerable flaw. What's that? And the don't f- what? Don't tell my Arsenal. Yeah, no, I'm going to the game yeah. tomorrow. We play Chelsea. What? what why would you go with Clive Owen? <laughs> Are you really? Yeah, we're going together. <laughs> How did you come to support that Terry very Henry. small North London team? Terry Henry. You can't blame me for that, though. Well, he's a great guy. I mean, I, I, that's how that was my end. That was okay. my that was my okay. end to Arsenal. Okay, he's you know. and then we became <laughs> friends too. Come on, don't hate me for that, <laughs> Terry Henry. So you will be there Saturday. We, we at White Hart Lane don't even. Refer. Who's your team? Spurs, the team of North London. The great team of North London. Aye. Right. Um, then you woke we, up. We'll see this with a new stadium. <laughs> We've got a new stadium coming. <laughs> That's going to do it. You've got to come to a derby game between Arsenal and Spurs at some point in the future to see serious football and to see us whip your butt. But so with- derbies when uh, two teams... Two teams from London right. play each other. Yeah, yeah, that's that's right. the derby. That's right, yeah. So where is it this year? Is it aren't no, there? we play. We will play once. Uh, 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 oh yeah, home yeah. It's home and home and away, right? Home and away. Yeah, yeah. So we'll see where we get to. So what happened to England in the World Cup, though? Well, you know. Next, next question. <laughs> Spike, we're here to talk about. <laughs> Spike, we're here to talk Spike, about the like clans, but not not the 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 England's performance in the. The previous World Cup. The expectations were low and the boys done well. It was a young team. Yeah, mainly I can't, Spurs I, players, I, 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 I can't way. talk. The United States through. even make it. So we even make the World Cup. Right, well, of course, but that's the United States. You still have... I mean, we've sent Wayne Rooney over to help you guys out. Um, they ran him out of here, right? <laughs> <laughs> sort of age thing. Yeah. We all get old. I'm 61. 61. <clears throat> Born March 20th, first day of spring, 1957. But you, you feel the same, right? You feel, you, you, that's the, that, you just give that off. You could be like, huh? 40, Black don't 50, crack. Or have you got. <laughs> <laughs> Black don't crack. <laughs> we will end there. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. Well, thank you. I want every, I'd just like to say this. I want to thank everyone who's supported my films. In England, the country in England, the UK, London, have always had a always have had a great time coming over here. Have never received anything but love or support. And thank you. Come out and see this film. Let's keep it going. Thank you, Spike. Thank you, my man. Thank you. Hello, I'm James O'Brien. Thank you for watching this episode of Unfiltered. Not only is there plenty more where that came from, but there's plenty more to come as well. So make sure you subscribe to Unfiltered and put yourself at the front of the queue for all forthcoming interviews.